I'd like briefly to pay tribute to Eric Davidson because unfortunately I can't be here on Friday. So he was an extraordinary person and a remarkable scientist. And I keep in my mind uh, the last time I saw him in Paris when he gave a seminar at the Pasteur Institute. He insisted on standing propped up on a huge shepherd's crook like a biblical figure. It was an inspiring seminar and afterwards there was a very thought-provoking discussion which continued in the Dome restaurant on Bouvard Montparnasse, which he used to like. So, like many of you, I very much am disappointed and sad that he isn't with us today. So, I want to talk to you about um, different origins and regulatory networks that underlie skeletal muscle formation. I don't know if I can get this to work. So, there are two sources of skeletal muscle in vertebrates, and I work, I do genetic manipulations in the mouse. So I'm, talk I'm showing you results on the mouse. Uh, one source is, uh, contributes to the head and neck muscles, skeletal muscles. And this has its uh, origin in the second heart field in pharyngeal and anterior mesoderm. And the second source for trunk, all trunk and limb muscles, the paraxial mesoderm of the somites. And I'll talk a little bit first about this um, aspect and then about this and I'll make a few evolutionary comments at the end. So just to remind you, somites form, of course, on the other, either side of the uh, axis, the neural tube and the notochord. And here is shown schematically the dorsal part of a somite. Uh, this dorsal part of the somite gives rise to a number of derivatives, including skeletal muscle. There are three base phases of skeletal muscle formation. First, the cells delaminate and form the myotome underneath this epithelium. Subsequently, they will migrate out uh, into the limbs, for example, where skeletal muscle masses will form. And thirdly, this whole structure breaks down eventually, and the population of Pax positive cells here cascade down into the underlying muscle. And these cells provide the reserve cell population for fetal muscle growth and also for muscle regeneration in the adult. All these cells express Pax3, and in the central domain, Pax7 is also expressed. Skeletal muscle formation depends upon activation of the myogenic uh, regulatory factors, MyoD, MIF5 principally. Uh, so I seem to be having the same problem. So then the simple uh, cascade involves PAX3 at the top, activation of the myogenic regulatory factors of the MyoD family, and then skeletal myogenesis. So of course the network is much more complicated than that. Uh, here's an example of the network that works in the trunk, but the important point is that PAX3 is up at the top here, and to make skeletal muscle, you have to activate uh, members of the MyD family, MyOD, or MIF5. And other genes also intervene, as indicated here, and signaling pathways too, of course. So actually, very little was known about the targets of PAX3, and a number of years ago now, we set up a screen to look at PAX3 PAX targets in the embryo. Um, we made an allele of PAX3 expressing GFP so we could fact sort the cells that interested us. And then we made a gain of function allele with um, the PAX3 DNA binding domain attached to a powerful transcriptional activation domain. And this gain of function allele actually saves the mutant phenotype. So that was our screen and we looked at, um, we looked at um, PAX3 positive progenitors in the somite um, at different stages. And basically this screen, I won't, I just summarized the results, some of the results here, um, showed us that PAX3, and we, we um, verified that these were direct targets by transgenic analysis in the embryo and all the appropriate manipulations you can imagine. So MIF5, which is the first of the myogenic regulatory factors, is a direct PAX3 target. Most of its enhancers are directly regulated by PAX3. It has many enhancers according to the site of expression, the site of skeletal muscle formation. MyID is an indirect target. Upstream of that, we identified uh, an enhancer at the three prime end of the FGFR4 gene, which directs expression to skeletal, to myogenic progenitors. Um, sprouty genes, which are intracellular, encode intracellular inhibitors of FGF signaling, are also targets. And we could show that this crucial step in any stem cell story between uh, self-renewal and movement downstream towards differentiation is regulated by this FGF signaling set up, which is directly under the control of PAX3. And upstream of that, then in the somite, where cells are still multipotent, 
the choice between the myogenic fate, which depends upon Plax3, and other cell fates, which depend upon FOXC2, is also under the control of Plax3, in that FOXC2 is a negative target as Plax3, as indicated here. And this is indirect, but genetically, Plax3 is in charge of this situation. So one comment is that this key upstream regulator is actually controlling different steps in the progression towards making skeletal muscle. And this is just an example. There are many other Pax3 targets um, that came out of our screen. So I'd like to talk a little bit about this key upstream role in controlling cell fates, because I think it's conceptually interesting. So the early epithelial somite will give rise to all these mesodermal derivatives, cartilage and bone from the ventral part of the somite. This is under FOXC1, FOXC2 regulation. And these other derivatives too, like um, endothelial cells and smooth muscle cells of some blood vessels, also under the control of FOXC2. Uh, brown fat, also influenced by FOXC2. And skeletal muscle, which depends upon PAX3. And la at later stages, when the derma myoterm, the dorsal part of the somite, is still present, as I showed you in the diagram earlier, uh, then this, is, this still contains multi multipotent cells with these different cell fates, whereas the ventral part of the somite by that stage has completely down-regulated PAX3 and is completely on the FOXC2 route to making, towards making bone and cartilage. <coughs> so an important point, of course, is that we could show by painful single-cell um, PCR analysis that FOXC2 and PAX3 are expressed in the same cells. So the cells of the somite are co-expressing these two transcription factors. So, I won't go through all the genetic manipulations which led to this, but then, as I said, we could show that PAX3 and FOXC2 reciprocally inhibit each other genetically, and that if we shift the balance genetically towards FOXC2, then we get non myogenic derivatives like uh, vascular derivatives, for example. And if we shift the balance slightly towards PAX3, then we shift into myogenesis. So it's rather like a sumo wrestling match. And we think that the, in fact, we could show that the battle between FOXC2 and PAX3 keeps the cell in a multipotent state. But as soon as it's moved, the equilibrium shifts one way or the other, then the cell will tend to move into one pathway or another. And we postulated that signals that coming in from the surrounding tissues and from the somite itself that modulate this equilibrium will then affect cell fate. So just a brief example of this, since, as I said, I think this is conceptually interesting that you keep a cell in an undecided state by this kind of mutual antagonism between factors. So we looked in particular, for example, in this, in this case, at the forelimb level where only two somite derivatives migrate out to the limb, because that makes life simpler rather than having multiple derivatives. And basically, they are FOXC2 positive endothelial cells which are marked early, already in the somite, by FLIC1 expression and by PCAM expression later. And then there are PAX3 plus myogenic cells marked early in the somite by LBX1 and later by MIF5, the myogenic regulatory factor. And we made a... So this is... Oh yes, okay, so I put this in just again to show you that one shouldn't think that there's only PAX3 and FOXC2 there. And in fact, again, there's a whole gene regulatory network which is controlling uh, how these cells first migrate out into the limb and then move into myogenic differentiation. Always myogenesis is depending on these factors, and always PAX3 is occupying a key upstream role. So we did this experiment by knocking NICD, which is the intracellularly active uh, form of notch, a transcript encoding the intracellularly active form of notch into an allele of PAX3. So this made, uh, this was then, um, mice expressing this allele were constitutively expressing notch. And uh, we, it was a conditional allele, so we activated with the PAX3 CRE. So when we activate this um, intracellularly active form of notch in our PAX3 positive cells, then PAX3 goes down, FOXC2 goes up, MIF5 goes way down. So we've altered the balance between our two sumo wrestlers, and we get more endothelial cells in the limb. And if we do a genetic trace using a trick with um, MIF5 Cree on a rosa so that we can follow somite-derived derivatives, 
then we can show that in this situation we get more PCAM positive cells. Um, this is the blue column here, compared with PAX3 positive cells. So we've shifted the balance towards FOXC2, and we've shifted the balance towards the endothelial fate. That's the message I want to transmit. And since it's difficult to use notch mutants in this situation, because somatogenesis is compromised at the stages that interest us, uh, we used uh, explants and uh, inhibitor of the notch signaling pathway. This is a rather crude experiment, but we can put, we can put paraxial mesoderm somites at limb level into culture, and they will develop in culture. And under these conditions, if we're inhibiting the notch pathway now, we can show that the notch readout HE1 has gone down. We can show that PAX3 has gone up relative to FOXC2. LBX1, which is an early marker of myogenic fate in the somite, has gone up relative to FLIC1. And the 5 has gone up relative to PCAM. So in conclusion, then, this is just an example to make my point that notch signaling in this situation targeted to the cells which interest us, the PAX3 positive multipotent cells initially, um, will shift the balance in favor of FOXC2 and will shift the balance in favor of the endothelial cell fate. So before I go on to the second part of my talk, there's just a twist on this story, which uh, might be interesting from an evolutionary point of view. And that is that up until now, we'd worked with FOXC2 mutants. But Tom Kumi, who's our collaborator on the FOXC side of the story, has now developed um, conditional mutants for FOXC1 and FOXC2. And we could use our PAX3 CRE then on these. And if you just use the FOXC1, uh -huh. FOXC2 straight mutant, the somites are rather shot to pieces and you can't do much. But with this conditional mutant, um, we could look and see what was happening. And we thought that if we knocked out both FOXC1 and FOXC2, um, then we would expect to um, promote the myogenic cell fate and knock down the endothelial cells, of course, from what I just told you. <coughs> and in fact, that's what happens in the trunk of the embryo, for example. Here's an embryo where skeletal muscle masses are forming, marked by myoD. And this is a classic picture. And here, I don't show you more detail, but there's overproduction of the myogenic myoD plus cells. Their numbers is about doubled. And this is what one sees, actually, in the PAX3 gain of function uh, mouse. But to our surprise, if you look at limb for limb level, here's the forming myoD positive muscle mass here in the wild type. But we can't see any muscle forming in the mutant. So that's the opposite of what we would expect. And we wondered if we'd damaged the somite in this experiment. But actually, at the stage when myogenic cells would be delaminating from the somite and moving out into the limb, uh, there's some delamination going on, as you can perhaps see here. Um, but there's no difference between the mutant and the wild type somite. So here you can see marked by PAX3 cells beginning to delaminate in both cases. So the somites seem to be fine. But if we look a day later, then whereas normally the PAX3 positive cells now marked in green have gone out into the limb, um, in the case of the mutant, they're all blocked at this level and they haven't moved into the forelimb. So we used, we bred these mutant, conditional mutants into a reporter mouse for Rosa Tomato. And under the influence of PAX3 CRE again, we could sort out the cells that interested us in the somites at the stage when they should have been moving out to the limb. And we could uh, look at the percentage of endothelial cells derived from the somite. This is at a slightly later stage marked by PCAM. And we could see that as we knocked down FOXC2, um, we increase the number of PCAM cells, which is what we would expect. And if we look then at, we decrease the number of PCAM cells. And if we look at the ratio of LBX1, that's our myogenic marker, early marker in the somite, against FLIC1, that's the early endothelial marker in the somite, then as we would expect, we've increased the proportion of um, LBX1 positive cells, i.e. myogenic um, progenitor cells, as we knock down FOXC. So all that's what we would expect. But nevertheless, these cells have not moved out as they should into the limb. And what happens to them? In fact, they undergo premature differentiation. So this is a myosin marker, which at this stage would not normally be expressed in the cells going out to the limb. They're already expressing myogenin, which is another myogenic regulatory factor, but they're not yet expressing a skeletal muscle myosin. Whereas these cells that have got stuck here in the mutant, um, not only are they expressing myogenin, 
shown here, but they're also expressing myosin, and you can actually see that they're tending to form muscle fibers, as you can see here. So in fact, these cells have differentiated prematurely. They haven't gone out into the limb as they should have, and normally they go out to the limb, they proliferate, they make muscle out there. So we're still looking to see what the mechanism is exactly. We think that it's due to F ephrin signaling between endothelial cells and myogenic cells. But the point I'd like to make then is that in the absence of FOXC1, FOXC2, the endothelial cell population that migrates from the somite to the limb is lost. And this is a small somite-derived component, and the lack of it does not affect vascularization in the mouse limb. So you could, under, you could ask why was this small component conserved in that case, because functionally it's not important for making blood vessels in the limb. And in fact, loss of this endothelial cell population repercusses on the Pax3 positive myogenic cells present in excess, which differentiate prematurely and fail to migrate to the limb with the loss of all skeletal muscle. So I would say to you that the conservation of this small somite-derived population of endothelial cells is to do with crosstalk between these two cell types. And this is a paper on this phenomenon in the chick. In the chick, um, many, most of the endothelial cells of the limb um, come from the somite, but in the mouse, that's not the case. And nevertheless, this population is still playing an important role. So that's a evolutionary moral, if you like, and we're still looking into the precise mechanism. So now I'd like to come back to the second part of my talk about the uh, cells that, um, the origin of head muscles. So genetic tracing experiments classically show then, as you would expect, that Pax3 Cree on a reporter mouse marks trunk and limb muscles, and this is due to their origin from paroxysmal mesoderm and somites where Pax3 is expressed. And the muscles of the head are not marked by the Pax3 Cree. They're marked by islet 1 Cree on Rosa, and islet 1 is a gene, a transcription factor, which is present in cardiac progenitors. It marks cells of what we call the second heart field, which are cardiac progenitors. And just to again make the point about gene regulatory networks, um, head muscles are not at all under the regulation of Pax3. It's not expressed at the right time in the progenitor cells. They're under the control of PITX2 and TBX1, for example, and these are genes which are involved in cardiogenesis. Again, you don't make skeletal muscle in the head as in the trunk unless you manage to activate this family of myogenic regulatory genes. That's a common theme. You have to activate that gene family to make muscle, but the upstream regulation in this context is quite different. So there's a whole gene regulatory network that one can draw for the cardiac progenitors in what we call the second heart field. And um, islet 1 is a key regulator. TBX1 is a key regulator. NKX2.5 is also a key regulator. And these are all implicated in the formation or in the marking of the progenitors that make the head muscles. I just to make a, I'd like to make a little comment. All these regulatory networks that I draw up uh, based on gene knockout experiments and functional analysis in the mouse, but they're never done on single cells. They're always done on populations of cells. And one of the great achievements, I think, of Isabel and Eric was to succeed in creating this kind of network on the basis of single cell analysis, which we in the mouse still have really failed to do. So the heart. <coughs> so the heart, of course, has um, different chambers, ventricles and atria. And basically, the heart pumps blood uh, around the body through the arterial pole of the heart, the aorta, and pumps blood around the lungs through the uh, pulmonary trunk at the arterial pole. And then the blood drains back through the pulmonary vein and through the superior cable veins back into the venous pole of the heart. And at this point uh, in the adult heart, these two poles are lined up next to each other. So that's just to remind you what a heart looks like. Did you change the battery on this uh, pointer? Well, <coughs> anyway, so I now want to talk to you at the end about a lineage analysis that we did. Because as I told you, genes that mark cells in the cardiac progenitors of the second heart field also mark cells that contribute to head muscles. Um, but we wanted to know if there's a clonal relationship between these populations. 
So we used a genetic approach to cell lineage, which was um, devised by my colleague at Pasteur, Jean-Francois Nicolas. And it involves using a reporter LACZ sequence, coding beta galactosidase, which contains a small duplication, which introduces a stop codon. So this is incapable of making beta galactosidase. But a rare intragenic recombination event converts this to a functional LACZ sequence. And then if this LACZ sequence is um, under the control of elements that are expressed, uh, then the cells will be beta gal plus, and under X gal they will be blue. So we knock this cassette into an allele of the cardiac actin gene because we wanted to do a retrospective clonal analysis on the heart. And I, this clonal analysis depends on statistical analysis because you have to show that the frequency of this event is such that it's very unlikely that there were two recombination events in the, in the sample that you're looking at. <coughs> so just very briefly, this analysis which we first used for the heart showed us that there are two cell lineages that contribute to the heart. One is the so-called first lineage, which labels the, uh, right the left ventricle, and to some extent, so this lineage makes the left ventricle and contributes to the atria and very minorly to the right ventricle. And the second lineage is a major contributor to the right ventricle, to the poles of the heart, and to the atria. And this correlates with what we now know about what we call the second heart field, and the second heart field, then, is uh, defined in terms of gene expression and functional analysis of genes. And in red here, I show differentiating cardiomyocytes, first in what we call the cardiac crescent, and then in the primitive tube. And uh, the green shows the progenitor cells of the second heart field, marked by islet 1, for example, um, which initially are positioned here and subsequently are positioned behind and around the heart, heart tube as it develops. And these cells feed in to the poles of the heart to make this contribution, which correlates precisely with the lineage contribution that I showed you previously. So, so we were interested then, as I told you, in seeing there was a lineage relationship between the head muscles and the heart. And we could do this because with this mouse, because cardiac actin, of course, marks the heart, the myocardium of the heart, but it also marks forming skeletal muscles. Later on, they only express skeletal actin, but to start with, they express both cardiac and skeletal actin. So here are the forming skeletal muscles of the face, for example, the head. And therefore, we use this method. And as I said, it depends on a rare recombination event. And just to give you an idea, when we were looking at labeling in head muscles, we analyzed almost 1,600 em embryos for 42, which showed labeling in head muscles. And similarly, when we were looking at venous pole, for example. So this analysis depends on a whole collection of embryos and doing statistics to be sure that you're looking the, the probability is that you're looking at one recombination event. So basically, I show you a couple of examples. So here, for example, it's a clone now. This is an example of a clone, which is labeling these head muscles, um, the masseter temporalis, and cells in the myocardium of the right ventricle. Here's another clone, which is labeling facial expression muscles and myocardial cells at the base of the arterial pole of the heart, where the pulmonary trunk and the aorta will subsequently form. So this kind of analysis then showed us, if I can move the slide on, that there is indeed a clonal relationship uh, such that the uh, myocardium at the base, so such that right ventricular myocardium is um, clonally related to these head muscles and that the myocardium at the base of the pulmonary trunk and the aorta is linked to facial expression muscles, and there's an early left-right segregation so that you see left facial expression muscles with the pulmonary trunk, for example. All these cells derive from MESP1 expressing cells very early during gastrulation, and subsequently they're, for example, marked by islet 1. And I should say that the lining up of the branchial arches from which these head muscles derive, the mesodermal core of the branchial arches contains second heart field cells, and, uh, as, and the first branchial arch is lined up opposite the right ventricle, the second opposite the arterial pole as the morphogenic events take place during development. So just a final point. So neck muscles. So neck muscles are interesting because they represent a transition zone between trunk and head. And in this transition zone, you find PAX3 plus semitically derived muscles, but you also find PAX3 minus islet 1 plus second heart field derived muscles. 
and the cucularis, which of course is a celebrated um, ancient muscle in the mouse, is composed of tra trapezius and sternoclastoid muscles. And uh, as you will see, there is indeed a clonal relationship. Here again is an example of these muscles. Here's the trapezius. And this time, the clonal relationship is with the venous pole of the heart. So the left atrium in this particular case and the, the left superior cable vein, which also has myocardium in it at this stage, at this level. So also for these neck muscles, which are not semitically derived, you know what, I think another, I need another few minutes for the time it takes to punch this button. Anyway, so, at the, so also then at the neck muscle level, we see this um, clonal relationship between the uh, non-semitically derived neck muscles and the components of the venous pole of the heart. And again, there's this left-right um, distinction. I should say that the pulmonary trunk, which is, of course, up at the arterial pole, is very interesting because it has also a component in common with the venous pole of the heart, distinct from the component which makes head muscles. So just to resume this, <clears throat> here's, the, here's this sort of summary. So there's this major lineage which is contributing mostly to the left ventricle. And then there's this second lineage which is contributing to the right ventricle and these other components of the heart, including the venous pole, atria, etc. But this component then bears clonal relationships to the different types of head and neck muscles which um, I have indicated to you. I think I can quick I can jump this, but these muscles are being form, formed from the second heart field itself or from the mesodermal core of the branchial arches, which contains second heart field cells. And there's this progressive movement from anterior to posterior as development proceeds with these contributions, which um, change in time as these different types of muscle come in. And just my final comment about the evolutionary implications of this. So it's interesting that Siona, the Acidian, um, Siona intestinalis, which is a urochordate, um, has islet 1 and KX2.5 TBX1 homologs expressed in what is now referred to as cardiopharyngeal mesoderm. The, the Siona has a very well-defined heart, so these um, cells that express these uh, genes contribute to the formation of the heart, but they also contribute to the formation of siphon muscles, which are skeletal muscles. Um, in this uh, urochordate. And there's an interesting article in Nature published last year which discusses the um, evolutionary implications of this, and it was called, it was Lionel Christian who showed this interesting network for the muscles and the heart of Siona. Amphioxus, of course, is a cephalocordate. Um, it, it's cl it classically has somites which give rise to myogenic activate cells that activate myogenic regulatory factors and form muscle. A PAX37 homologue is expressed in the somites of amphioxus in these progenitor cells. So that's very reminiscent of the second way of making muscle invertebrates. I should say, though, that amphioxus also has equivalent branchial muscles, uh, skeletal muscles, which are formed transitorily from cardiopharyngeal mesoderm, also expressing these genes. So obviously these themes are played upon, and um, the theme for making the anterior muscles of the vertebrate is obviously an ancient theme, which is also um, employed by ascidians. So I'd just like to end by saying this work was carried out in my lab in the Pasteur Institute in Paris. That Tom Kumi is our collaborator for the FOXC1 and 2 mice. Tim Mohan helped us do the imaging of the venous pole of the heart in particular, and Robert Kelly is a long-time collaborator. And these are the people who worked on the skeletal muscle part of the story, particularly Alicia Meyer for the data that I showed you. And these are the people who worked on the lineage analysis for the heart, particularly Fabian Lescroa, who did a lot of the lineage analysis showing the link between head and neck skeletal muscles, the clonal relation, and different parts of the heart. So thank you. <clears throat>